I want to introduce you now to uh, Dr. Angus Lawler, who um, is a assistant professor here in UCD in the School of Computer Science and Informatics. He's a funded investigator also in the Insight Center for Data Analytics. His primary research interests are in the area of machine learning, artificial intelligence, explainable AI and recommender systems. And he applies this to sports analytics and uh, medical imaging. He's been actively involved in a lot of different research projects in this area over the years and is working on some very significant uh, collaborations with industry. Um, he's also worked on grants from Enterprise Ireland and SFI, and his research has led to several granted patents as well. So over to you, Angus. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brian. So what I want to talk about today is some of the work we've done on uh, a data definition of hitting the wall for marathon runners. And again, this work really started, I think, when a little bit after Barry had started to work on data analytics of, of running, and he said, we've got this problem. And so I kind of got into working on the data as well, and also started um, running on the back of it to kind of better understand the data and the kind of processes behind it. So um, I think on my first marathon, I don't think I hit the wall. I kind of feel like it's a club you want to reluctantly be a part of. When you talk to marathon runners, they're like, oh, yeah, I hit the wall like seven or eight times. And I, I kind of wish that would happen to me somehow. But it didn't happen the first time, so maybe the next time. And this is work done with um, our student, Yakum, who now works in Kitman Labs. Um, and I'll just take you through some of this. So some of this has been kind of referenced in Barry's work before. Um, when we're talking about the marathon, the interesting thing about the marathon is really the, the quantity and the quality of data that it generates. And this is something that's changed over the last few years as well, as people have better trackers that can collect better quality, more high resolution data. Uh, this kind of really helps us as computer scientists. Um, there are much better watches that have more accurate GPS. They also have heart rate detectors and so on. So this is kind of the opportunity for us. And in terms of participation as well, in the last 10 years, I found these statistics that in countries like India, they've had over a 200% increase in participation in marathon running. So there's been a fast increase in the number of people who are participating in marathon running. And if you look at the countries that have improved their average marathon times in that same 10 year period, you can see here that Ireland has improved by about seven minutes, which is pretty significant on average and countries like Switzerland have improved by 14 minutes. So this isn't a case of just putting on your running shoes and going for a run. Training for a marathon is a multi-month uh, event that requires significant preparation, training, and so on. And these people need uh, guidance, which is where the recommender systems, the computer science side comes in. Um, and also, these are people that are really pushing to improve their performance. And again, that's something where we think we can, we can help them. So building these kind of smart coaching systems, recommendation systems to guide or adjust or suggest uh, new human behaviors is kind of the target of most of our work. Now, when it comes to the wall, again, there's a famous picture of this, uh, this poor runner in the London Marathon. Uh, people kind of say, well, you know it when you see it. And that's largely true. Um, you know, this kind of jelly leg syndrome or where the legs just don't obey what the brain is telling them to do is fairly obvious. But in fact, many runners who report hitting the wall don't experience these kind of symptoms. They experience collapse, fatigue, a whole range of other symptoms. And there isn't a precise definition for what exactly hitting the wall means. We also find that there's a vast amount of advice that people give about how to avoid hitting the wall. And much of it is based on uh, intuition or guidance from coaches and not always kind of referenced or backed up by literature. So again, most of the things we can, these kind of common tips here, do weekly long runs, run at least one 18 to 20 miler, don't go out too fast. This again is the danger, as Barry mentioned, of starting too fast uh, and finishing slow. Um, taking breaks, walking breaks during your marathon is again a common tip. And of course, good nutrition and hydration is also really important. And again, in this meta-analysis that uh, Alison mentioned in her talk, it was found that the one kind of feature that most predicted whether you would hit the wall or not was whether you'd done one, at least one 32 kilometer run in your training period. Um, all the other factors were found to have 
variable kind of uh, impacts on your performance. So this is something that we're trying to look at. Can we come up with a data definition of the wall and then relate it to things like your, your training history and maybe make recommendations for how your training might change or how you might change your pacing during the race in order to avoid hitting the wall. So what exactly is the wall? Well, uh, again, these numbers vary by marathon, but somewhere around 40% of runners who run marathons report having hit the wall. It usually starts after the halfway mark. So I think 33 kilometers is the most common onset point for the wall. Of the runners who do hit the wall, 70% of them experience a slowdown. So this, you might conclude that 30% of them don't actually hit a, experience a slowdown, which is kind of remarkable. They, they report hitting the wall, but they don't actually experience a slowdown in their pace. And of course, as Barry mentioned as well, uh, males are much more, much more likely to hit the wall than females. Again, the reasons for this are not understood, but everyone seems to have an opinion on it. Uh, so what can we learn from this data study, right? So, so we tried to analyze the wall using the data that we had. Um, a lot of the data came from the marathon data that Barry had scraped. And we also got some data from Strava.com, um, which has activities and also training data. Um, and some of the, the kind of statistics are there. So if you look at the pace profile of a marathon runner, this, is, this would be quite an accomplished marathoner here, as I'm sure you can tell. So we can see the kind of uh, features here that would indicate this is a, a person who's run a very good marathon. The finish time here is under 200 minutes. You can see they have quite an even pace. There are variations here, but it's quite an even pace. And what I'm showing here is the average pace. And so you can see at the start, they go a little bit behind their average pace, and then they gradually speed up over the course of the race. So again, this would be a very nice runner who did a very good job of pacing, pacing their marathon. And this poor runner did, did, did kind of everything wrong here, right? So you can see here, they started off way too fast. And then by about the 26, 27 mark, they suffered a pace collapse. And you can see their pacing kind of went down to about walking pace here at the end. You can see these big peaks here. They're maybe trying to recover by stopping to take a break, to walk, or maybe uh, take, take on some, some water, or some nutrition. Um, and then interestingly enough, after the kind of peak here, for the final couple of kilometers, they actually recover, start running again, um, and, and almost recover their pace to their mean pace, right? So, and again, this would be fairly typical for somebody who hits the wall. And so this um, led us to try and uh, come up with uh, a way of identifying runners who hit the wall from runners who don't. And so we use these uh, clustering techniques to partition marathon runners into those who hit the wall and those who don't. And these are the averages of these two clusters. So this blue cluster is those who hit the wall. That's a, this would be a typical race profile for those runners. And what you see, and this, uh, this orange one here is the runners who don't hit the wall. Now you can see in both cases, uh, they tend to go out a little bit too fast and then finish a little bit slower. Again, this is like an average, but you can see for the runners who hit the wall, um, they, they go out way too fast, right? So there's a big difference in how they start the race. And this kind of, oops, this point here at the end, there's about a 20% uh, slowdown experienced by those who hit the wall. So again, this starting pace here is noticed to be about 10 to 15% quicker. Um, and again, this work is, is, you can find this in, in this paper here. So this led us to identify those features a little bit more precisely. And then these features we can use to, uh, to categorize or analyze the kind of pacing of runners and put it into some of our machine learning techniques. So we came up with this defini definition here where you know, we, we've kind of quantified and identified the specific phases of a race and how it might relate to the wall. So you can see we have the wall start, we have the duration, we have the intensity, the recovery, the peak slowdown, and so on. And so these features what we'll use when we're building our machine learning models. Now again, Barry has presented uh, some of these results, um, a little bit more detailed analysis of uh, the marathon record. So I'll just go through these very quickly. One of the things that we find is based on based on age. So I'm showing here the, the, the axis here is age. We've got male and female runners. And we see that um, as expected, men are much more likely to hit the wall than females. Now again, there's a subtlety which Barry is mentioning here is that we don't know what the target is of these runners. So some of them are targeting maybe a personal best. Um, in that case, they might be more likely to hit the wall. We don't know what the training, what their kind of fitness level is or any of the other 
uh, things which would impact on the wall, like their nutrition or their hydration. So a lot of things that are missing. Again, this is just a data analysis of many marathon runners. We also find that the intensity of the wall is greater for, for men than for women. Again, it's not a huge difference, but, but definitely men experience the wall more intensely. And we also find that women tend to recover after having hit the wall. They tend to recover a little bit better. So again, I don't know if this is because they know what kind of uh, behaviors to change. So in terms of walking or reducing their pace or taking on nutrition or, or water, uh, is it just that they're more informed, better, better informed, or they just respond to, uh, you know, the kind of feelings of fatigue or pace collapse? We're not exactly sure what the reasons are. But again, this result has been, uh, is kind of found for all of the marathons that we've analyzed. Um, we, also we also looked at this in terms of um, the finish time of the runners. So this is a kind of a measure of um, whether the runners are elite runners or recreational runners. So these would be the elite runners over here. And we found that the recreational runners, um, that more of them hit the wall than the elite runners. Now, there are more recreational runners, but again, they're more likely to hit the wall um, than, than the elites. And we also find that um, the impact here, so in terms of the intensity, the impact um, or, or, the, or the kind of the intensity of the wall on the, the finish time of the recreational runners is larger than on the elite runners. So again, this kind of gives us a, a good motivation for improving and building these recommender systems models that can help the recreational runners because there's a lot more people in this category here um, that we can kind of assist than, than these kind of elites, which who probably have professional um, advice anyway. Um, and so then in terms of the proportion recovering, we can see then that um, the recreational runners are also more likely to recover from the wall um, than the elites. Uh, yeah, okay. And, uh, and again, I think, you know, if you want to look at more detail uh, in terms of the training, in terms of people who are trying to achieve their personal best, there's more details in uh, Barry's paper. Um, now, one of the things we also looked at, we were interested in was, was not just the wall in terms of uh, the kind of the impact or the intensity, but also the psychological effect. And one of the things we noticed in the self-reporting of people hitting the wall is that um, it, it seemed to be driven by, you know, course related features, the weather, whether there was a crowd or there wasn't a crowd, or certain features like the elevation uh, in uh, at certain points in the race. And so we looked at some of the uh, the leading marathons and trying to relate certain parts of the race um, with the probability of somebody hitting the wall. So this is probably the audience that's most likely to recognize marathons from their elevation profile. Does anybody know which races these are? Boston, no. So which one is London? No, this one is London. Does anyone know this one? No, it's New York. Uh, this one is Berlin, so I have it on the next slide. So, this, so Berlin is actually a pretty flat uh, marathon course, which is why most people go there to, um, I think, achieve if they're kind of targeting a record. So Berlin tends to be fairly easy. And you can see in Berlin, most of the people who hit the wall, they tend to hit it right at the end. So this is really their fatigue. Um, but you see interesting kind of behavior in the case of the London Marathon, where when they get to this kind of Canary Wharf part, um, it's, it's, there's a big spike in the numbers of people who hit the wall. And it seems that the Canary Wharf part of the London Marathon, there's not that many spectators and it's a kind of a windy part of the course and the number of bridges you've got to go over, it's really tough. And a lot of people hit the wall at that point. And again, you might relate that to a psychological effect. Um, they're clearly not, uh, well, I don't know why they would be more fatigued here than they would be for any other marathons. And we also see similar effects in New York. For example, the Queensborough Bridge is this, this point here. Um, and in the New York Marathon, you've got to go over this bridge. And the elevation of the bridge is quite high. And again, not many spectators. So a lot of people hit the wall at this point. And also, there's a big spike here just at the very end. There's like a little hill in Central Park here coming up, which is really tough right at the very, very end. And again, a lot of people experience the wall here at that point. So again, when it comes to the wall, it's not just purely physiology. Um, there are effects of the course, the profile, weather, and, and kind of psychological aspects as well. So what we tried to do then was to uh, take features. So based on these features that we used to 
um, to analyze people's uh, profiles, their, racing, their, their running profiles, uh, we were able to build runner representations which came from their training data. We were also able to build a training set of data of runners who success, successfully ran the race and were very similar to these runners in terms of their training history and their ability and their kind of likely um, finish time. And we were able to then recommend a pace to those runners that they should follow in order to avoid hitting the wall during the marathon. So this is work that was published in our uh, Pace My Race paper, which was presented at Rexis uh, a number of years ago now. Um, and again, one of the nice things here is that we're, we're kind of using these recommender systems models to build, um, to build pace recommendations that are personalized to the runner. They account also for their training profile and they learn from runners who successfully ran a race at similar paces, but avoided the wall. So they're also course specific as well because we can train them with runners who ran on the same course. Now, one of the things we've, we've also tried to do, uh, we've, we've tried to put some of this work into apps which can make these recommendations. This is difficult to do. It's difficult to recruit runners for these kinds of tests um, to kind of build the apps and get them to use it. Um, so we're just kind of showing a mock-up of what our app would look like here. And one of the things we do in uh, the Insight Center is to try and explain the recommendation. So we realize it's no good to say to somebody, here's what the model predicts in terms of what your pace pacing should be. We need to provide an explanation for why the model thinks that's the right thing to do. Um, and so when it comes to training for a marathon race, which is you know an activity which might take four months or six months of your time, uh, providing these kind of explanations for guided behavior is, is essential. So this is something that we're working on. How do we provide these explanations? What, what form should they take? And what's the most effective form they take to guide a person's behavior in the right way? Now, there are other apps which provide recommendations for pace during the race, but most of them provide, you know, like average pace. So they just block the pace out and they tell you if you're going above or below average. Um, but, but getting a recommender system to run on a watch is a kind of a, a trickier task. But again, this is kind of where we see um, in terms of the future, incorporating much more information. We'd really like to have information on nutrition and hydration and sleep quality. Um, this is all information that's missing from this kind of data analysis, right? We have pacing information, but we don't have all the other information that's necessary for making really good recommendations. So just then to, to kind of conclude, um, I think as everybody knows, hitting the wall is an important phenomenon to study. It's something that anyone who's training for a marathon really wants to avoid. Um, these large scale data analysis uh, give us some novel insights into um, what exactly the wall is and how people experience it and also ways that we can um, avoid it. So again, basing these kinds of decisions on evidence of what people do to avoid the wall, we think is kind of the right way to go. So we need to understand the wall um, in order to learn how to avoid it. And there's also a lot of scope here for, you know, recommender systems or these kind of smart models that can uh, guide human behavior. You know, when you, th you think about training for a race, again, a long period of time, and it's often very difficult. So the kind of suggestions that you make to runners are often uh, not ones that they kind of readily accept. So how you do this and how you change behavior is again, a, a kind of an interesting problem for um, the kind of recommender systems that we're looking at. And of course, I think there's an argument here for much broader um, human sensing. Again, there are all these sensors are out there about what we eat, about the sleep and different kinds of exercise that we take. And again, we don't have those integrated for a large number of runners. So that's something we'd, the kind of a direction we'd really like to go in. So that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angus. I don't know if there are any questions from the room or are people scared to ask questions about the wall? Okay, we have one. When you say someone's going out too fast, uh, how do you determine that they're going out too fast? You're looking at the previous data or how do you determine that? So for these runners, we know their training history. So we, we know the activities they've done for the previous four to six months. And we use these models that we've trained to predict their, their, their finish time in the marathon. So that's how we know if, if they're going out too fast. In terms of those models, 
Where, where could I find one of those? Um, well, you can find them in the papers. So, so I think Barry mentioned the regal model or the regional model, which is actually pretty good. The area there is about seven to ten percent. We've built machine learning models which get down to I think three percent kind of error. So, yeah, public use. Uh, I don't think there's a repository online, but uh, you know, if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, I'll. Yeah, or that. if anybody wanted to invest quite a lot of money in a startup. That, that would be another route to, to getting that out there. Um, Thank you. I, we have one more. Okay. So, so yeah, I think Allison is gone, but what, so they did a meta-analysis of thousands of papers, research that have been done on this. And they found that the one feature which predicted whether you were, so let, let me get this right. I, I think this is the right way around. The one feature which was most predictive of whether you were going to hit the wall or not was if you had not done a 32K run. Yeah. No, not the more, one, one, yeah, this one. Okay. Okay, we've one one more question. Ingus, thank you very much for sharing your, your reservoir of reservoir of big data. Uh, I have I have one I'm kind of locking horns with you a small piece because traditionally uh Martin runners were always thought of that it was a physiological effect that happened when you burn when you burn simply when you burn out your carbohydrates and you go into break down your fats and the fats are broken down more slowly. And that's the reason that you slow down. And that happens. The only thing I can agree with what you're saying there is that it does happen around the 18, 20, 21 mark. That depends on the pace. But in, from my view, it's, a, it's largely a physiological effect. Right. I'd, so I would agree with that. Yes. So the collapse of pace is largely, you've just simply run out of energy. Yeah. But then, but people do take on nutrition during the race. They take on water and so on. So the precise point at which it happens and the effect is again, you know, things that we're trying to understand. But, but Angus, what I thought I understood from what you were saying is that the psychological element may be what triggers it, you know, and right. it, that it is physiological, but that there may be a psychological trigger for it. Sure. Yeah. And also people recover. That's the other interesting thing. They recover within a, you know, seven to 10 kilometers. They often get back to their average pace again. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.